And, and, and good afternoon, and, and, and thank you, Don, for that kind introduction. It's great to be back at Nagas. Uh, I had the opportunity to be here for the annual meeting in Louisville, and I'm happy to be here in Denver. And I want you to know this is my first official trip as the Chief of Staff of the Army. So I just want to let you know where the National Guard stands in the Army's priorities. And I understand next year the meeting will be in Boston. So there you have it. And I'm just saying, you know. And, and as you know, the Guard has a long, rich history. And it's been the key to defense for 383 years. So it'll be good for you to get back to your roots where it all started in Boston. A few folks out there. No, I, and again, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proud Boston sports fan. Um, but watching the Red Sox play this year has been good Army resilience training. So I think we're going to bottle it up and issue it to the troops. And, you know, and I, I know we got a lot of distinguished visitors here. I'd like to rec recognize a couple. Uh, Representative Kelly, uh, who's got a very distinguished career, not only in the National Guard, uh, but also uh, serving our country. Sir, thank you for being here and what you do every single day in D.C. I, I think we have two former Chiefs of the National Guard Bureau, General Temple. I think he's, he's right. Sir, thank you for your service. And General Grass, I think, is, is here also. And I've seen many uh, of the tags, both past and present, uh, really appreciate uh, what you do every single day uh, for the Guard and for our Army and for our nation. So how about a hand for them? And my, my, my good neighbor, the 28th Chief of the National Guard Bureau, you just had General Joe Lengelt. Great to see you. We, we see more, you know, on the road than we do back in D.C. And then Dan Hokinson, and I think Scott Rice, is Scott Rice here? If he's not, he's, he's probably watching the Red Sox. That's probably where he is right now anyways. But, you know, the, here, here's, here's the, I want to deliver it. You know, the Army senior leaders, we clearly know the heavy load the National Guard has been carrying over the last 18 years at both home and around the world. And you ought to be really proud of that. You know, on the home front, you battled wildfires, rec rescued victims of flooding, you delivered life-saving supplies to residents following storms and hurricanes. And I know you're ready for Monday when Dorian hits and you'll, you'll do another great job. You've been part of the Defeat ISIS forces, your trained partner in nations in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you operated shoulder to shoulder with our allies and partners all over the world. And the Army absolutely cannot do what it does without the National Guard. And we're proud to serve, we're proud to fight, and we're proud to win along each and every one of you. So I want to thank you all on behalf of Secretary McCarthy and give yourself all a big hand, okay? And I would ask, if, if you don't remember anything else I say, aside from the fact that the National Guard is doing a fantastic job, remember two things. Winning matters, and people are my number one priority. Because you see, our Army, the National Guard, the Army Reserves, and regular Army serves to defend the nation. And we send the United States Army somewhere, we don't go to participate. We don't go to try hard. We go to win because there's no second place or honorable mention in combat. Winning matters. It's an attitude. It's a mindset. And we win by doing the right things the right way. We win through our people. And that's why people matter. They, they are the Army's greatest strength. They are our most important weapon system. And that's why people will always be my top priority. And when I say people, I mean National Guard soldiers. I mean reserve soldiers. I mean regular Army soldiers. I mean our families, our civilians, and our soldiers for life, our retirees and veterans. And we must take care of our people and provide a positive command climate where everyone treats everyone else with dignity and respect. And it's our people who will deliver on our readiness, modernization, and reform efforts. You know, many of you have seen the new national defense strategy, and that's a major shift for all of us, because after 18 years of irregular warfare, we're moving to a new phase of great 
power competition. And while we, we must remain ready today, we must also modernize the Army in order to maintain our competitive edge and overmatch in the future against great power competitors. Therefore, readiness, modernization, and reform remain the Army priorities. And we're going to continue on this path. And for our division and brigade commanders, we want you focusing on tactical readiness, making sure your, your units are ready to go. At our level, we'll make sure you have the resources to do that. And at the Army level, we're going to focus on strategic readiness, making sure that we can get our units mobilized, we can get them deployed, we can get them in the theater and sustain when they need the cop conduct combat operations. And you all play a critical role in that. We couldn't have carried the mission load we've had all these years without the work that you have done on some really challenging and important missions. And we know you all are extremely passionate about your service and you want to deploy. But we also realize that comes as a cost as well. We know it can be challenging to balance Army service in your civilian careers. We recognize that tension, and we are working closely with the National Guard leadership to make sure we have the right balance of deployment and dwell times as we move forward in our model so we can keep all the tremendous talent that we have in the force. And so you'll see that coming out in the next few months as we take a look at how we rebalance the force. We must also continue to move on modernization. We're doing some credible things on modernization. We've changed our system. It's no longer an industrial age system, and we're going to aggressively pursue new technologies that are going to give us an edge on the battlefield. But modernization is not just new equipment. It's also a new concept in how we're going to fight, and that is the multi-domain operations concept. And we're going to produce that at Echelon so we can operate in this great power environment that we're, going to, we're, that we're going to live in. It's going to be the six modernization priorities. Those will not change. And it's going to be a 21st century talent management system so we have the right people in the right place at the right time. And when it comes to reform, we cannot be an industrial age army in the information age. We're going to have to transform all of our industrial age processes so we can be more effective, protect our resources, and make better decisions. We've stood up at Army Futures Command under General Mike Murray, and he's going to, I know he's talking to you a little later in, in the program. And he's drafted the initial multi-domain operations concept that we all want you to read, participate in, and take a look at how we'll all work to support that. We're starting to experiment with new organizations, one called the Multi-Domain Task Force that's going to bring capabilities in cyber, electronic warfare, space, long-range precision fires into our force and, and take advantage of space. And we'll be experimenting with that as we go in the future. We'll soon be translating the Multi-Domain Operations concept into doctrine, and that will be coming out. We're especially, over the next years, going to be fielding new equipment. And those will be coming to the National Guard, those will be coming to the Reserve, those will be coming to the regular Army. And that will be dependent on how we're going to fight in the future to so make sure that all our units are postured to win. We're going to build... <laughs> we're going to build out your Apache battalions, 24 aircraft. We're going to phase out all your M1A1s. We're going to get you your JLTVs. We're going to replace your older UH-60s. And as we look at aircraft and new systems like the future long-range assault aircraft, those will come to the Guard. We all, And now I want to talk about talent management. And I think this is really important because, as I said earlier, people are the Army. And right now, we basically manage our soldiers by two variables. Think about it. Your rank and your MOS. You're a captain of infantry or a sergeant of engineers. 
And our system doesn't really compre comprehensively manage the other talents in our force. So we're missing opportunities to match talented people with real Army requirements and opportunities that can make us a better, more effective, and more lethal Army. And I was just visiting Fort Pickett a couple of weeks ago, and I saw Tim Williams and John Epperly down there, and I got to see the great 116th BCT doing some wonderful training. Are you here? All right, so you're back. All right. And you know, I saw our soldiers and leaders doing the right things, working hard, getting after being highly trained, disciplined, and fit, and building cohesive teams. But what I also saw was a perfect example of what I'm talking about, the amount of talent in those units. In that small sample, in that brigade, just one brigade, there was a nuclear engineer, there was a GS-14 with the State Department. There were multiple experts with certifications and experience in computers, communications, IT. There was an FBI analyst. There was a CIA field operative. There were at least two business owners. There was a bunch of police officers. There was a certified paramedic and a whole bunch of other folks that had skills that were unrelated to their MOS. And I'm willing to bet many of your units have much the same. Many of you here are senior leaders in companies. You're agricultural experts, you're engineers, you have experience in diplomacy, public works, and many other relevant fields that will help us in the future compete in this great power competition. And they will enable us to do our mission much, much better. And the same is true in the reserves and the regular army. We have a tremendously talented force. But right now, we don't take full advantage because our system doesn't allow us to manage it effectively. And part of the way we think we can manage it better is bringing in a new system, the integrated personnel and pay system. And what that's going to allow us to do is manage the talent and assign jobs that match Army requirements to soldiers' knowledge, skills, behaviors, and even this new thing called preferences which is kind of blasphemous to the Army, but you know, if we can have people going where they want to go and what they want to do, we think we're going to have a much, much better Army. And right now we're rolling out IPSA uh, first. We are rolling that system out first in the National Guard, as many of you know. And I, I do want to thank Pennsylvania. I don't know if Pennsylvania's here, uh, but they were the first. And they did a great job of, of, of putting that together and Virginia, D.C., and we've got about nine states right now that, that are making that happen. And that is really going to make a difference for the entire Army over the next couple of years. So if you have some questions, talk to Pennsylvania. They were the lead leaders on that. They've done some great work. But, 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 but here's the thing, too. It is, it's, it's the pay. What really bothers me and I've seen this, is the fact that we don't have all of our components on one system is not fair to you all. So when you go on active duty, we mess up your records, we mess up your pay, and we've got to fix that. That's just not the right way to treat soldiers in the United States Army. And it, And, and I've, I've, I've had a chance to talk a couple of tags, and we're, we're going to fix that. But when I, when I look at the reason that happens is we have three different personnel systems. And it's like if you were a rear road, you have different gauge rear roads. So when you go from one, one state to another, if you have different, different gauge rear roads, you have to download the entire train and then put on another train. And when you're doing that, you lose things and break things. And, things aren't quite right. And that's really how we do personnel and pay. So we've got to fix that. And we are going to fix that. But there's other things that we're doing as far as talent management. We're looking at how we select commanders. And we, we actually ran a, a test program, um, almost like a combine, a four or five day assessment program to make sure that we're picking the best battalion commanders. We're going to do assessments at our captain's career course 
to make sure that we have people in the right branches and they may want to go do something else and we can start identifying the talents they have for future assignments. We're going to a new merit-based order of merit promotion list for our non-commissioned officers. So those who do the best on the promotion board will be promoted first. We're looking at more flexible career paths where you, it's not linear, where you can go back and forth between forces and still progress. We're instituting brevet promotions for certain positions. We're looking at stabilizing soldiers for longer periods of time. And we're looking at how we attract soldiers with critical skills, even to the point of getting them direct commissions up to 06. So there's a lot of things that are going on in the talent management side of the house, because again, the Army is people, and we've got to take care of our people if we want to maintain being the world's greatest force. So in closing, I want to thank you all again for what you do every single day for the nation. You really make a difference. We're real proud to be on the team with you, and I am honored to serve as your chief of staff. People first, winning matters, Army strong. Take some questions. That was awesome, sir. Well, thank Can you, you take a few questions? Yeah, I'll take a couple questions, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'll take General McConville says uh, he can take a few questions. I'll take a couple questions. Yeah, so go. please go to the mics if you have a question for the Chief of Staff of the Army. Yes, sir. Right on the left, sir. Sir, okay. Georgia yes, sir. National Guard, 48th Brigade. How will the Army improve and implement its acquisition process to get the military what it needs to meet its current and future challenges? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would argue, and some, I, I don't want to hurt any of our acquisition professionals here, but we have an industrial age acquisition system that is too slow for what we need it to do. And we are in the process of changing that. And you know, if, if you take a look at how we were doing business in the past, we have a linear system, it would take us five to seven years to write a requirement. And we would take that requirement, we would pass it over to our acquisition professionals and they would do all the right things required by law and regulation in five and seven years. They, they might get something on the contract and would go to our great industry partners and they would take that requirement that may be as high as the roof in here and try to meet every one of those requirements and maybe deliver us a, a program in 15 to 20 to 25 years and that's our, our system. And we know how fast technology is moving and that is not the speed that we need to stay relevant. I'll give you an example. Since we've stood up these cross-functional teams, uh, we are writing requirements in four to six to eight weeks. We are working with industry right now, and, and we're almost doing, I don't want to call them shark tanks, but what we're doing is we're going out to industry and saying, we have a problem. Here's what it looks like. We bring a whole bunch of people in the room. We tell, tell them to come back in a couple of months and show us how they're going to solve that problem. A hundred may come back. We downsize from that. We maybe go to 10. We give them a little more um, requirements because now we see what they can do. We tell the next bunch to come back with maybe a model. Maybe there's five. Get a little more. Draw them down. And then we actually have them build a product. We put our soldiers on it. They get a chance to try it out. They test it. And we write the requirements for what's obtainium and we're able to quickly turn that, and we are doing that across our six modernization priorities. That's what we want to do. And that's how we're going to get equipment quick. Um, we may have some industry partners there. We enjoy you spending your money on internal research and develop. You spend it much better than when you're spending our money, and we get a much better product for that. So that's how we're going to get it. We're going to get good programs to you all. One of the best, the fastest programs I've seen, transformational, is this system called the Integrated Visual Augmentation System. Coming to your infantry, your armor, and your cavalry and special forces soon, okay? It's gonna transform the way our soldiers operate on the battlefield. And that's a program that's probably gonna happen in less than one or two years. But we're doing things right now, um, hypersonics. We're, we're gonna be shooting things in about two years. We're driving things, we're flying things. You go down, and, and take a look at what industry's doing. We're flying and driving before we buy. And quite frankly, the, the feedback we get from industry, they like that. 
They, they operate in the present. Um, and the other thing we're finding is non-traditional industry are, are, is coming in and competing for these programs the way we're doing business right now. So we got a lot of work to do that, but you know, the, 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 the idea I'm putting out there, we cannot be an industrial age army in the information age. And so, you know, take a look at, I don't even know what that means to everybody, but think about that in your organizations. If you're still doing it the same way we did 30 or 40 years ago, we probably haven't moved on. Some of the, the, the you know, some of us think we're in the information age because we took the leap blank, major digital form, and now we move it through 21 stations by email. That's not the information age. We can do things much, much better. And you all can help with us that because many of you are out there in companies that are in the information age because they're competing. So that's what we want to do. Thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Stan Zatarski, Colonel Retired, the National Guard Association of California. I apologize up front if this sounds like a hardball question, but uh, listening to the previous speaker and talking about our national American treasure of the National Guard, and this would go across component lines, the new national security strategy, and I, which the national defense strategy is nested into, we're really going to be looking towards strength through peace. And when we have uh, that involves more than just military might alone. It involves, you know, it involves everything about the, uh, the soldiers, or the education, all of that. And what I'm leading up to is the alarming suicide rate, which is higher in the California National Guard than the other components, but it's high all the way around. And my question is, what are we going to do to address that, what resources are, and what's going to be the scope that you take a look at that? Because when we take a look at national security strategies, the, of one bygone, the values have changed. It's, it's no longer uh, uh, in California that they have a recruiting problem, and I've read about it in the National Guard magazine, but I don't believe it's because people don't want to come in to the Guard or they're afraid of war. I believe a lot of our young people are smarter than that and the best ones might not be coming because they don't want to die for, and I hope I don't offend anybody, gender parity, gender identity, gender equality. They're looking at the new values that are in the, and so what my question is, what are you gonna to do to address that? And what's going to be the scope that you're gonna provide uh, resources? How far are you gonna look out? Yeah, let, let me think, first of all, I don't think that's a hardball question. I think everyone should have concerns, um, if you're a parent, um, why you should send your sons and daughters to the military. I think that's a legitimate question to ask. And here's what I would argue why you should do that. First of all is purpose. You know, you should join the military because you want purpose, because you want to be part of something bigger than yourself. And I don't think there's any better place to go than the military to do that. Second of all, you want to belong. You want to belong to a team, and I would argue, and in, in, in most of the polls bear this out, a team that's the most respected institution in the country. And third, if you're a parent, and I am a parent, and I sent three of my kids uh, into the Army, and it wasn't just because I was G1 and I needed to make recruiting numbers. I actually, <laughs> I, uh, I actually thought that it was a pathway to success. And I believe that the Army is a pathway to success, unlike any other organization in the country. Having said that, I'm not walking away from the ills that we have in the Army. Suicides is a national concern. Now, here's where I am on suicides. I don't, I don't personally believe that people commit heart disease, they die of heart disease. Stay with me, okay? I don't believe people commit suicide, they die of, of suicide. And that's the way we need to think about it because what we have to do is we have to attack the behavior health problem. And one of the challenges that we have is there's a stigma attached to behavioral health. Now, if you have a problem with heart disease, no one says anything, you know, guess what? You wouldn't think twice about going to a doctor to think about heart disease. 
And the way we need to look at heart disease is there's people that are higher risk for heart disease than other people. Some of them, it's genetically, some it's their, it, it may be that they, 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 they have high cholesterol, they, they may not eat the right things, they have other things in their life that may contribute to them being high risk for heart disease. I think it's the same thing with suicide. I think there's some people that are higher risk for behavior health issues than others. Some it's genetically, some it's by, you know, they had adverse childhood events while they were growing up, and we need to get after it. I argue the way to get after that is we have to train our folks at the lowest levels to build this thing I call cohesive teams, where every single soldier has a leader, a squad leader that cares about them. Every single soldier has a buddy that cares about them. Within that little chain of buddies, squad leaders, they know the family. It's almost like a golden triangle around every single soldier. They protect that soldier. They look out for that soldier. And when that soldier's having a bad day, they know it. And what they do is they get that soldier to the behavior health officer. They get them to help. And they do it because the company commander, the battalion commander, quite frankly, the chief of staff of the Army is not going to know who's having problems. But we inculcate that into the culture where every single soldier has people that care about them, that are looking out for them, that make sure they're being treated with dignity and respect. And when you do that, a lot of the ills that we have inside the military will go away. The sexual harassment, the sexual assault, the suicides, the discrimination, the cyberbullying, you name the list of bad things that can happen to our soldiers. If we develop cohesive teams at every single level, we'll get rid of that stuff. And the other thing we have to remember, thank you. The thing we have to remember, too, is the physics of the United States Army. Every single year, there's 120,000 to 125,000 new soldiers coming to the Army. So if you're a leader, you can't stop getting after those type of things. You cannot stop caring about your soldiers. You can't stop making sure everyone is treated with dignity and respect. You have to do that every single day because every single day you have new soldiers coming into your formation who are coming with the values, they're coming in with the issues, they're coming off the street. And if we do that, we will remain the most respected institution in the world. We will remain the world's greatest army and, and as under my leadership, that's what we intend to do. Yes, sir, Thank you. I, just if I may, um, we're on, the same, we're on the same sheet of paper there, and, and I won't burden you. What I would like to see, and I'd, I'd like to see a, an aggressive, comprehensive program with some goals to do that, because I, I, to, to reduce suicide, that not, it not only involves the training of the program, but invo involves behavioral psychology. It's, it maybe takes a look at the culture that we've uh, uh, kind of uh, seeped into, and I'd like to see that goal to do that. I don't agree that uh, suicide's like a heart condition. You die a suicide. I think a lot of times soldiers take their life because they might feel like they're a burden. They might feel like there's a lot of things. They might feel like they're not useful anymore. And so I think it's a little bit more complicated question. So I hope, without asking more questions or burning you any more of, your, more of your time, that the Army can develop a comprehensive program, especially in the Guard, and take a broad look out, uh, you know, that includes all of the behaviors that might be affecting suicide. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. And if you got some good ideas, just send them to us. We're, we're, we're open-minded. Okay. Sir, Captain Songer, uh, Kentucky Air Guard. I've got a question. We talked uh, a little bit about multi-domain operations. We're, we're touching on it, and it seems like all the classes and courses I go to. Um, currently, there seems to be a lot of inefficiencies, though, across the services. We've got duplication of efforts and that kind of thing. So what are the plans, what are your thoughts about making that a more efficient scheme where we're not, we're not having the duplication? And specifically, I would suggest things like cyber that don't have a proximity issue, moving those to the guard, where we can, we can take that mission on, we can do that mission 24-7, really, without proximity to the battlefield. Yeah, let me, let me start with your first question um, on the multi-domain operations. You know, it, 
You know, we, we are at a, a inflection point on thought too. And, and you know, one of the um, challenges is each service is coming up with their own ideas on how they want to fight the future fight. And we clearly know it's a cross-domain fight. You know, if you, if you kind of think about, you try to put where we are in history, at least from um, the, the Army's perspective, some would argue that it's like when we were coming out of Vietnam. We came out of Vietnam, uh, we were in a great power competition with, with this thing called the Soviet Union. Um, the, the leaders of the Army and the Air Force at that time came up with a concept called Airland Battle. And they came up with a modernization effort, which they called the Big Five in the Army, and that was the Abrams tank, it was the Bradley, it was the Apache, it was the Black Hawk and the Patriot. And there were some other things, but the Big Five kind of was all they could fit on in hand, so they went with those five. Um, you know, you can only have so many, there's so much memory techniques. And, and then they, they did the doctrine that went along with that. So what's different now? Well, what's different now is precisely what you said. We got, we got this thing called cyber. We got this, we got this thing called space. Um, and the, 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 the battlefield is, is, is very, very different because it's actually, it's global competition. And when we look about, even if you if had a chance to look at multi-domain operations, what, what you know, we're, we're in a competition phase, but many want to go to a penetrate, disintegrate, exploit type phase. And, you know, if you're at the strategic level, you don't want to get to that level when it comes to great power competition. Great power competition does not mean great power conflict, nor do you really want to mean great power conflict, because you got a great power conflict, we got some serious, serious issues. But you need capabilities below that level of uh, kinetic um, fighting that you can impose cost on other adversaries for, 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 for misaligned uh, behavior, and that is where cyber comes in. And so from, you know, when we see it from the Army standpoint, each of the services has equities in each of the areas. It's, it's, it, 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 it's, you know, the Air Force has a ground force and some capabilities to secure its bases. The, you know, the, the Army has Army aviation. It doesn't mean we don't have a great Air Force, but there's going to be, you know, certain capabilities that each service needs so it can do its whole function. And whether it's in the guard or, or the reserve or the active, um, we can work that out. The, the thing that um, I, I, I'm looking for, and this gets into my whole quest for talent management, we have a lot of talent in the guard and reserves in these areas. And what I would argue is, and, and you know, kind of my whole thesis is, it's masked sometimes by the person's, you know, rank in MOS. You know, I mean, we, you know, we, we have a logistician and nothing, you know, that has a PhD in computer science and, and artificial intelligence. And it's like, we can't see that unless we go to a new system to get people in the right way. So, um, you know, as far as we're cyber, I think we're going to retain that capability uh, in the Army. I'd like to see more of the Guard and Reserve, and, 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 and you know, we'll work out the rebalancing that is going to happen. And that's one thing we talk about. We're talking with your leadership, and we want your input is, you know, we're going to have to take a look at the the entire army when it comes to the national defense strategy on, you know, do we keep things the same way? You know, things change over time. And I've talked to a lot of the tags. They go, I, I, we, we got to have a discussion on, you know, some have come to me, hey, I'd like to rebalance this. I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. We got to have that discussion and take a look at what the tasks are the army needs to accomplish in conjunction with the joint force and then decide how we actually allocate those tasks with each of the components. And, and that's what we're gonna do over the next couple of years, okay? Great. Thank that you. Proximity. I don't, did they give you the mic to hook on the Turn mic? Turn it back on. <laughs> they could, Cut they me could, off. They could, <laughs> No, sir, I don't disagree, but if I may, the, the proximity piece I think is important to, to consider because the Guard does bring that where we can fight from the homeland and affect the battlefield anywhere across the globe. So that, that's my only point. I won't take your time. But I no, I, I agree there. I mean, you know, and, and really, if you look at what we're doing at the, at, at the highest levels is more of a global integrated base plan philosophy where we're not just looking at, you know, because you may 
you know, you know, historically we try to influence the country maybe in one place. We may not do that. You know, there's other places you can influence people that may not even be in the geography, they may not be in the domain. And, you know, it, again, that's a whole different way of thinking about where you actually conduct operations given the networks we have, um, you know, as we go forward. So, right. okay, thank, thank you. you. Sir, I think that's, if it's okay with you all, yeah. if we have time for it, okay. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come with us. Congratulations on being our new chief. We look forward to working with you. The association and the adjutant general look forward to working with you. We got a small gift for you, sir. It is uniquely uh, representative of our host states, Colorado and Wyoming. It's very cowboy. It's a great belt, and if you wouldn't mind, we'll take a photo oh, together. Absolutely. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much. Sir. Gotta, got no photographer? Get anyone here no photographer. Yeah, okay. There's got to be someone here with a camera. That's a great thing, okay. sir. Okay. Thank you very hey, much. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. All right. Well, the Sergeant at Orange, please escort our distinguished guests from the stage.